So what did we start learning for the exam two? Uh, do you remember? We started learning partial derivatives. That was a pretty cool topic. I think most of you liked it. So uh, at first it was pretty straightforward until it got into chain rule thing. So let's practice that. Let me do that. Partial derivatives. Let me check if I'm recording recently, I forget. Yes. Partial derivative. So if I make a mistake, first rows, you should let me know. Partial derivatives, uh, they are already on the exam, either the hard ones or the easy ones. Mostly multiple choice though. Well, I cannot say it's not in the free response because even if we put it in free response, it can be find partial derivative, now find a tangent, a slope, so it's still like partially. Partially, it's a partial problem of partial derivatives. Let's Something messy like this, and I can ask you to find anything. Find. And you have to be careful and read carefully the problem. If I ask you to find partial derivative with respect to x, and it's the first partial derivative, then you see y as a constant. So I have 4x cubed times constant. It will be 12x squared times constant. Do you agree? So y is a constant. It sticks to the whole thing. Oh, let me do minus y at the end. Let me do minus y. Just put it minus y cubed. Put it at the end minus y cubed. Then minus 7x y squared is minus 7x constant squared. So it's going to be minus 7 y squared, right? Because the derivative of x is 1. And then minus 3 y squared. No, minus 0. Good job. Because y is a constant derivative of the constant that is isolated, which means standing by itself, is 0. Because how fast the constant is, 0 fast. Now, if we ask you to find second derivative, you repeat that. So let's practice y. 4x cubed y. Now your brain has to switch fast. y is a variable. 4x cubed is a constant. So it's going to be 4x cubed times 1, right? Minus 7xy squared is 7 constant y squared. So it's going to be minus 14xy, correct? Is it too fast? This is a good time to stop me and, and slow me down. Minus 3y squared. Partial derivatives. If I ask to plug numbers, guess what? You plug numbers. And so on. We also learned the theorem. The theorem for uh, nice, nice functions. Functions, nice, are continuous, they're smooth, they are differentiable, partial derivative exists, and so on. Second derivatives. Mixed second derivative are the same. And it's not like I'm going to ask you a theorem on the exam, but just reminding you that that was the case. For for nice function, that's the case. Sometimes if they're equal to each other, people can conclude, oh, probably at that location or everywhere, function is nice. So how about the hardcore um, chain rule, right? How about some kind of crazy chain rule? And I ask you to plug crazy points. For example... That was example one. I can I will share you these notes with you, just letting you know, so you don't have to write it down if you don't want to. So find the partial derivative of the function oh, with respect to x. Okay. Find the partial derivative for and then f is something crazy like e of course to the x squared plus x y cosine x plus z, so third dimension shows up, to the 10 e, wow, to the 1 over minus 1 over x minus y squared. So, you know what's the first step of this, uh, this type of problems? Step one, not to freak out. Like, I look at it, I freaked out right away, you know? But I believe in myself. I think I can do it. So your job is, like, not to freak out. And if you did, like, inhale, exhale, you can do it. We did it in the review today, so you can do it on Tuesday, right? Solution. Maybe if you take 
uh, highlighter, you can help yourself to highlight the variable. So if I only ask you about to find x, and then for example, I ask you to, no, it's fine. Then uh, you can highlight the variable. So variable x, x, this is x squared, x, cosine x, x. Now I know where the variable is. So that might help you. Maybe bring a highlighter, I don't know, or just another color, red color, pen. So derivative of e to the u, remember chain rule, e to the u prime, u is a function, copy times u prime. That's chain rule. Deriv copy exponential function and multiply by the derivative of the exponent. So I'm going to copy this e, x squared plus xy cosine x, and then I do times derivative of the function and the exponent, but only, and now, so before even taking derivative with respect to x, what if I am a calculus one student, and I'm like, okay, that's easy, I just learned chain rule, take the derivative of the exponent, and then I see two variables there, and that's what tells you that it's this is multivariable calculus. There's so many letters there. Unless other letters are constants, you're like, wow, there's so many variables, what should I do? And that's what partial differentiation comes in. That's why. So with respect to x, 2x plus, so right now, this part takes you to the problem we just did. Nothing complicated there, we just did that. 2x plus x derivative of, okay, that's product rule, do you see? So you do product rule carefully. Derivative of xy with respect to x is y, let me put it in a different color, times copy cosine x plus copy xy times derivative of cosine is sine, yes? Negative. Good job. And that's only first E. Uh, do you want me to explain more what I just did, or it's not too bad? So the, in pink color, that was product rule. Product rule. Plus, and now I do the Z part. Z to the 10, I don't know if it's going to stay. If this whole thing on the right is a constant, everything is zero. But I put X there when I was creating this random example, not from the exam at all. Uh, then it's gonna be z to the 10 times e copy everything. Like a Russian doll, you cannot move on to the next level of a tiny Russian doll until you open the outside. So this first copy part, that's the opening the outside layer, layer or level. Times, and now in blue I will differentiate so that was not a product rule, as you can see. Z to the 10 was a constant. And now I'm differentiating E with respect to X. So, no, and now I'm differentiating exponent, this in blue, X minus Y squared with respect to X. What's well, a fraction? Uh, you can actually just root it out to zero. Just put it as negative X to the one. I like that. That is better. I like that. Very good idea. Thank you. What if we rewrite this as e to the what? Can you tell me? Uh, e to the what? e to the negative 1 divided by x minus y squared times x minus y squared divided by negative 2. No, I wanted you to tell me how did you rewrite it. Right? You just want to change the order. So I wanted to tell me that. Minus, so if I change the negative sign, are you talking about uh, this way or no? X, oops, wait, wait. X minus Y squared to the numerator. Yeah. And then? to the power of negative one. Oh, Agree? No, just for x minus y squared. Just for x minus y squared. Agree? Agree? Yay, thank you. <laughs> Good job. Yes, now we can differentiate that instead. So I already copied it, I don't have to copy. Now I'm dif 
I'm just differentiating uh, this part, right? Because I already copied. Yes, that's correct. So minus and minus goes down. That is going to be x minus y squared times to the negative 2 then times 1. Is that what you got? What do you think? Yeah? Okay, some people said yes. So any way you like. I was planning to do quotient rule, but this is faster. I like it more. So that's 1 over x minus y squared squared, basically. Which makes sense, because it was a fraction over there. And now if I ask you to plug, find fx at 0, 1, 1. So you just plug everywhere you see 0, 1, 1. You take a pencil and you say x is 0, y is 1, z is 1. If you don't see any z in derivative, then don't plug it. So that is the idea. Then you plug and you get some number. Well, I actually do see z. Can you do that? That's a nice multiple choice question. Because the answer is a number, so that kind of makes sense. Partial derivatives. Now, we definitely supposed to give you some chain rule. Uh, that's why let's practice some chain rule. Chain rule is when their x and y are also functions. So that makes it a little bit more annoying and complicated. In your approximation, tangent lines, chain rule. Okay, I found it. It's a basically mega chain rule. For example, example. Omega or W, in this case, I want to use W. W, so omega is like that. W is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Where x, I like to put it as a system. Where it's visually easier to read. X is a function S times T. Y is a function S times cosine T. Z is a function as S times sine T. Like that. I like it. This is visual. It's like where, blah, blah, blah. Yes, you can plug it in <laughs> if you want to and then deal with stuff. But we are supposed to teach you chain rule. Because if you imagine a huge function with 55 variables, plugging them back is undoing the work. Someone actually called them names and stuff. And in application problems, that's usually the case. You have 55 equations with 55 variables. You don't want to plug them all in. If you just learn how to do it right away. Just do it. Find. And, you know, some kind of random derivative. For example, derivative of the whole. So I can ask you to find derivative of y with respect to t. We just did that. That is not chain rule. But if I ask you to find derivative of w, that's chain rule. So that's um, derivative of w with respect to. Now I can ask you to find derivative of w with respect to x, y, or z. That's easy. 2x, 2y, 2z. That's not chain rule. But the moment I deep dive deeper, that's when it gets interesting. So, for example, with respect to s. If you want a, a sketch, I had w. w depends on x, y, z. And each has two pockets. S, T, S, T, S, T. That's the sketch. I imagine it as pockets of pens. There are three pockets or three legs, for example, and each has two pockets. And I can be asked to reach to any pocket. This one, this one, and this one. W, Z, S. Or W, Y, T. Any pocket is available to me, and I need to learn how to do that. So let's do it. Basically, you first differentiate. I don't recommend to memorize any formulas or those graphs they give you in the book. So not convenient. I learned without graphs, and then I checked the graphs, and they made me more confused somehow. So differentiate everything first, the way you know it. Derivative of W with respect to S means before I take derivative with respect to S, I have to de take derivative with respect to X because X has S. So I will write down 
derivative, there's a formula, of course, dw dx, if you want to write it down, it is dw dx. But I highly recommend just do it. dw dx is 2x times, times means chain rule. We're diving into the pocket of x. So from w into x, and then we asked about s. So now I'm diving into equation number one. Equation number one. I look at this s times t, derivative of s times t times a. With respect to s, it's just t. See, that saves lots of time if I don't write down all the formulas. But it is dw dx times dx dx. Does it make sense? Then I cannot stop here. If I stop here, I missed all the other two pockets. I need to go to y. I need to go to ys and zs. So you just repeat the whole process. I cannot go to this level until I differentiate a w. So I do plus and I do two more operations. Derivative of w with respect to y because pocket of y has s times second equation with respect to second equation of y differentiating with respect to s. S times cosine gives you cosine. There's one more pocket left. And if there's a 17 of them, you do 17 of them. 2z. And that's going to be a third equation. And the third equation with respect to s, s times sine t is sine t. That is the answer, but uh, this answer has like three variables, actually more, x, y, z, and t. Four variables, four dimensions. So it is polite and correct to rewrite it. If it's a multiple choice question, the answer will be already rewritten, so you have no choice there. And you plug everything in. That's why I like the system. Equation one, two, and three, you plug it into the answer. 2x gives me 2s, t, times t, so t squared, plus 2y gives you 2s cosine t times cosine t, so cosine t squared, plus 2z gives you 2s sine t times sine t. Very nice. So actually, it simplifies nicely. There's a cosine squared plus sine squared in the picture, so you can simplify it nicely if you want to. And then, actually, let me simplify. 2s t squared plus 2s. Guess where did the cosine and sine go? So there's a cosine squared and sine squared, and they multiply by 2s. I factor it out. Trick it, ain't it? Good job. Cosine squared plus y squared equals 1. Exactly. Someone said that too. Find partial derivative of w, uh, w with respect to s at. The bar means at. Sometimes it's parentheses, sometimes it's a bar. <coughs> and I give you like some very random number. So some people ask me about this. Let me uh, check it out. 3,0. And we don't explain to you what the heck that means. So we have x, y, z, and an s, t. How do we know which one is which? Well, if it's two-dimensional point, that's s and t. If it's 3, 0, 5, that's a three-dimensional point. Then it's x, y, z. If they match dimensions, 3 and 3, then they have to specify. They cannot just live without specification. But in this case, if there are only two of them, it cannot be x and y and z is ignored. That is not correct. This is a two-dimensional object. So it is S, T. Some people ask me, how do we know it's not T, S? Uh, international people agree to follow the alphabet. So it's the English alphabet, S, T. Yeah? Um, so how did you get from the two X times T to T, Y, so X times T? How did you get from there to the next step? Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, let me do the note here plug x y z equations uh, from this system so you have to plug them in does it make sense 
So wherever I saw x, I plugged equation number one, s t, y, I plugged s cosine t, and z, I plugged s sine t. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking, yeah. So now the answer has only s and t, so we know that 3 and 0 are s and t. Plug in the numbers, and you get 3, no, so it's 2, times 3 times 0, plus 2 times 3, that's 6, done. So that's a slope, that's a slope at the point, slope of a tangent line at the point. Can you do that? On Tuesday. So that's uh, definitely a giveaway. Chain rule and partial derivatives are there for sure. Can we do a what? Can we do a yes, we're gonna do it in a <coughs> second. That's why I wanted to ask who has nice formula sheets because the uh, equation of a tangent plane, equation of a tangent line can be there. And when I say can, probably it means they are there. <laughs> what? I'm making <laughs> No, no, don't get distracted. <laughs> You're making one right now. No, no, it's a bit too late. Uh, but someone in the forum posted some nice uh, cheat sheets. Again, if you have a nice formula sheet, can you give me right now to, to brag about it? Yes? No? Okay. <laughs> you look so happy. I thought you have one. So let's move on. Gradient. Gradient was important. Actually, to be honest, when you leave this class, not today, when you finish this class, hopefully with a good grade, you're supposed to know gradient. I always tell my students, what is the thing you're supposed to remember after this class? Gradient is one of them. It's not the only one, but gradient and double integrals and triple integrals. Surprisingly, if you go to civil engineering and stuff like that, I have neighbors who finished PhD and worked for 30 years in architecture. They do triple integrals every day at work when they're architects. So that's something you need to know. And not just for physics, of course. Triple integrals finds volumes and, and um, viscosity. So the liquids have viscosity and all of those cool things. Uh, heat waves, all of that is done from double, triple integrals. And gradient is everywhere. Gradient was a collection of all derivatives. This is the sign called del. It's a vector. Derivative with respect to x, so... If you want a short notation, derivative with respect to y, derivative with respect to z, and so on. So all, all partial derivatives, they all collected. Gradient is a vector operator which operates on a scalar function to produce a vector, which means input is a function and output is a vector. So a function, example, a function is... 3x squared minus x cubed plus ln, let's do y, y cubed ln z, right? Can you find gradient? Derivative, so input is a function. Input. Output will be a vector. That's a pretty cool idea. And the vector will have a collection of all derivatives. Very nice. It's kind of like, Okay, I found all those nice derivatives. Where, how can I nicely write down them in one place? That's gradient. And then gradient has lots of applications. But yeah, derivative with respect to x, really quickly, 6x, 6x. That's the first component. Derivative with respect to y, minus 3y squared. And derivative with respect to z is? 1 over z, one over z. amazing. So that's good. This, the magnitude, magnitude gives you uh, the maximum rate of change. Remember that. Maximum rate of change. If I ask you to test to find maximum rate of change, that is the size of this vector, vector which is magnitude. Magnitude. That is a number. The number. It's a maximum rate of change of the function at the point of the gradient, which points in the direction of maximum rate of change. There. So my uh, friend was showing me all these games he's playing, all those amazing uh, games in the space and whatever. So, including The Last of Us, right? Uh, and uh, there was like a character standing at the edge, right? 
fighting a boss and then just falling from the edge and the computer character just falls down and dies. It's like the stupidest way to die because he was fighting a boss. And like, yeah, that's exactly what I told my students. That's the great thing the same. <laughs> if you are at the mountain and you know, and you figuring out how to descend the fastest, okay? And you ask AI about it and AI doesn't care about your health. You're standing at the edge. Guess what AI will tell you? AI will not tell you to go to the left, towards the left side of the mountain or to the right. And that's why when you're talking about the left or the right, I'm talking about level curves. Here are the level curves, right? You are standing on the edge of this, of the top of this hill and on the edge. And you're looking down and you're like, whoa, I need to get down something. How should I get down fastest? Gradient descent will not tell you to keep moving around in circles, okay? It will tell you, hey, you know, maybe you should jump. So that's exactly what happened in computer game. Like, yeah, that's a good example of gradient descent. He was not surprised about my cruel example for some reason. <laughs> so that is uh, important. The questions we can ask you is direction in which the maximum rate of change happens. So that's gradient. So maximum rate of change is a magnitude, while direction, direction in which the maximum rate of change happens, direction of the maximum rate Rate of change means derivative, right? You know that. Rate of change. It's literally the synonym of the derivative. That is just gradient. So size of the gradient gives you the maximum rate. But if they, they ask you about the maximum rate of change, that's a vector. So that's what we reviewed. Yes? Yeah, your unit vector, sometimes we want to have direction with the strings. That's a very good question. The question is why we have several. The directional vector with a unit vector included when we want it just to point over there. And this one is just, uh, uh, and this one is different. Two answers. This one tells you the maximum one, the one like you jump over the cliff. And it keeps the length of it, which is pretty important. So if there's a current in the ocean, right, the direction now vector, which is unitized, will just say, okay, over there, there is a current happening over there, and it will not include any size of it. But if you want to know how strong it is, that gradient, and it's this strong, so it will take you away because you cannot swim faster than the current. So that one has a size, and sometimes we need a size, how hot that thing is, how fast it is, how strong it is. So that has a size. But that one, like, Mm -hmm. like, what is it point? It's like, is that one not the direction factor? It's just the direction factor. Yeah, it points towards the fastest change. Is that what you're asking? I'm just confused on, like, hmm. what the difference is between, like, the direction here and then, like, the direction of the unit vector. Does anyone want to answer? <laughs> like, I hope. Does anyone know the difference? Yes? They're in the same direction, but the unit vector. That's what I uh, was, okay, let me ask more people. Anyone else? I thought maybe someone would have a better explanation than I did. That's a very nice trick to see if students can have better explanation than what I said. But yes, they both point at the fastest change. There's the wind and it pushes me away, right? That's the fastest chest change of the wind. But one just says it pushes me over there. And this one says how strong it pushes me over there. They both point at the same place. They both point at the same place, but sometimes we don't need the size of it. Let me just show you the formula. Maybe that will help you. A directional derivative. Directional derivative. Very good question. Let's just do that right away. Directional. Yeah, thank you. That's for sure. It's very important. Directional derivative has a formula. The formula is this capital D, but we're using U, F, and then that's the official, and then explanation is gradient times U, where U must be a unit. 
that's uh, important. So let's check this out. Basically, if we ask you to find the directional derivative, you find first the gradient, which we just learned how to do. Those are partial derivatives. But then you want to get rid of the size. You don't want to decide. And directional derivative. I know what you're asking about. I just realized it right now. I think so. I think I can answer your question. So step one, you find partial derivatives. Those are pointing at the maximum change, right? Yes, we just said that. And the size of it gives you the maximum change. Step two, we're using some third vector, u. And if it's not unit, you have to make it unit. So this one chooses some kind of direction which means instead of using the maximum change, which is diving from the cliff, we are asking, how about if I'm just going around? So I'm choosing another direction. So I'm forcing, yes, I'm forcing the gradient to point to another place, but also see the fastest way there. Does that make sense? I'm, I want to have another direction and still find the best uh, way to increase or decrease. For example, yeah, I see the question, just a second. For example, here's the hike. I don't want to jump from the cliff. Yeah, that's not safe. So I plan to go here. That means gradient will point here, but I will have U. I'm making this U. And I'll say this is going to be my U. No, give me the fastest change where I'm pointing now. Yes. Is that answer? Yeah. yeah, okay. Nice. I'm very happy about that. Very good question. Very good question. Yeah. Yes? Um, what about oh. uh, gradient vector? So when you say direction, that will be the vector? And, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Is, is different from, well, directional derivative is different from direction, right? Directional derivative. Uh, yeah, it's different. So directional, vec directional derivative of the function is this formula. I know, right? If this uh, too many... Too, many, too much terminology, so it's kind of hard to figure out. Directional derivative is derivative with the given new direction. Oh, maybe that's how you should remember. Maybe write down. Directional derivative is a derivative with a new direction, while gradient is just derivatives. And the property of the gradient, it tells you the, the maximum change okay. in the direction. Very good. Yeah? Okay. Um, I was wondering how you would phrase it if you were looking for like, the unit vector because on the web work, I remember when they asked, when it asked the direction of the magic rate of change, it was looking for a unit vector. Yeah, very, very good point. In the homework, sometimes they ask you to also find only the unit vector. So then the whole result just divided by the length. That's an extra step, so they don't, you don't have to do it. Uh, web work definitely is very creative for no reason. <laughs> Someone put a lots of weird steps. So traditionally, we just do it this way. You have to be unit. So if they gave you V, which is not unit, you know what to do. Divide by the lengths to make it uh, to make it U, right? So make it unit. Yeah. So divide by its size and then multiply by the gradient. Yeah. Very good questions, people. Um, so I was more talking about the that, where you said direction of the max rate of change. So the direction is when you say that you mean like the actual gradient itself, we're not talking about the unit vector. Should be, yeah, good question. Should be just two ways to ask. They can ask both, and that's what they did in the homework. I remember that. They asked both. They ask the question is when they ask the direction, do we need unit direction or not? The answer usually no. Usually this one has size because I want to know how strong the wind is. <coughs> is it half stronger than the yesterday winds or not? But if they say find the unit directional one, unit, then you just do the extra step. See, Weber confused you with like, why would it do it? Yeah. Did it answer the question? So I will tell you on a test, I already can see it. See, those questions are good. Also because they tell me where you can get confused. So now I'll write it down on the exam. Unit or something like that. Very good. See, it's nice if you ask questions, all of you.
More? Equation of, yes. No, no, Sorry, go, go. It's not the same thing. Still the same? Let's work out the problem. Maybe I will show you. I mean, I can see that you have a very good point here too. Let me show you the problem and then we can work it on the steps. Example, if we ask you to find, and we will probably ask you to find, it's a pretty classic example for the exam. Find directional derivative of the function at the given point and the function x, y, z is x cosine y plus z squared, whatever. I don't know, I just made it up, not sure if it's good. At 0, 0, 1. I actually don't know, we'll see how it's gonna work out. So steps, steps. You find the gradient first. And the gradient consists of partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z, and more variables if we have more variables. If the function is too hard, find it step by step. In this case, I would just find it right away. Just put it there. So derivative with respect to x is cosine y, derivative with respect to y minus x si sine y, derivative with respect to z to z. Too fast? Or agree. See, I can do it so fast just because I practiced a lot. It's not nothing more than that. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Then you plug a point into it. Oh, and I forgot to show direction. Yeah. Right down at the end. At the point. Oh, I think it's this button. At the point towards, or how did they phrase it, with the given direction, in the direction of the vector v, in the direction of v, and v is given as a vector, like uh, minus 10, 7, 7. So directional derivative requires knowledge of two things. The original vector, well, three things, the original vector, point and a directional vector v. Step one, find the gradient. Step two, plug the point. Gradient at minus 10, 7, no, no. Gradient at 0, 0, 1 becomes, one more notation you see, not the bar, but the parentheses, it's the same thing. Or I can put a bar and write down 0, 0, 1. It's going to be, it's still a vector, and it's going to be cosine of 0 is not 0, it's 1, but then the next one is 0, and the third one is 2. Oh, very nice. So that is my gradient at the given point. So that was step 1 and step 2. Step 3, I want to multiply. I want to use the formula d u f which is directional derivative of f towards u, with the direction u. By the definition, this is what we have, gradient times u. But we don't have u. So we don't have u. So we need to make v to be unit. Well, actually, I don't know. I did not check. Maybe it is unit, but probably not. V is going to be minus 10, 7, 7, divided by the size of it, right? Which is 100 plus 49 plus 49. 100 plus 49 plus 49. And then you just, you don't really simplify, it's so just, it is what it is. Minus 10 all over 198. 7 all over square root of 198. And 7 all over of square root of 198. Like so. Finally, we're getting to the question you asked. 
And now we're multiplying. Oh, we're still not yet. Oh, so we plug the point. And we're now multiplying our vector times this unit vector. Before we multiply it, this thing, 1, 0, 2, tells us the fastest change without new direction at the, of the original function at the given point. So if I'm talking about the mountain, I chose the point zero zero one, and it's somewhere over here. And it tells me, oh, it's over there. So like this is the fastest change. But then I messed it up by choosing another direction. I'm like, yeah, don't tell me that one. What about there? What strings of the descent or ascent, so increase or decrease, will be towards there, to the north? I don't want to go to the east. They are zombies there, whatever. I watched too much uh, movies uh, this weekend. So then this U messes it up. And because I don't want a U to add any strings to the gradient, I make it unit. So I'm changing the direction and want to see what is the fastest, strongest direction towards there. What gradient will tell me towards there? How about that? No? I can think more and maybe answer it in the forum if you want more ideas. Let me see. If anyone have better idea how to explain, you should let me know right now. Well, probably like the unit vector is of the first thing we found shows the fastest way, for example, to get on the mountain. But they are asking not for the fastest way, they are just asking for the specific way. Like specific way and fastest way at a specific different yeah, way. Specific, yeah. Fastest way, not, or not general, but at this specific Yes, maybe that's even. So point was chosen first, but that's what's confusing here. We chose point first. At that point, it tells us, yeah, jump over the cliff, from the cliff from that point. But then I said, I don't want to jump from the cliff. How about going to the left or to the right? So I'm choosing direction over there. And it tells me, oh, that will be not the fastest way. And let me show you. The size of the new vector tells me how slower it's going to be. And it will point there uh, with a different length, basically, and everything. Maybe that will also tell you. Remember that since gradient is constructed from partial derivatives, if, when I choose a different path, that gives me lots of information. It's all in 3D. It's a mountain. I'm hiking down. I don't want to jump over the cliff. So I'm pointing, I'm choosing to move the direction over there with my U. Then it will give me a result, which we're going to find right now. And the result will tell me, oh, it is 17, 55, 30. That means how steep it is from height width and depth and from that yeah, that gives me lots of information if that uh, direction even is a good choice or not yeah i think that's maybe the best explanation you had a question um uh, you oh you yeah i fixed it thank you we don't have you make you you is the original vector divided by its length unless it was already unit finally it's a scalar product, so the answer should be a number. Oh, you see, then I definitely did not say right before. I mentioned the vector. Well, I did mean the gradient. The gradient has those components. They show you the steepness with respect to x, y, and z. But this directional derivative actually is going to be a number as the answer. So you multiply whatever we had at the point. So... Del F times U, that's going to be vector dot times vector, that red one, I don't want to rewrite it, the red one. And the answer will be a number, which is minus 10 over square root of 198 plus 0 plus 2 times 7 over square root of 198. So it is 14 minus 10, which is 4, 1, 9, 8. So that tells me towards there, the length, the fastest descent or ascent is different. It's a scalar. A scalar means a number because it's a dot product. Dot product also called a scalar product. Dot product. Wow. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? It's 
So spend a bit too much time on this, but I think the questions were good. So I did not want to just uh, tell you to ask later. I think the questions were really good. I think other people also have questions about that. Formula. I will just show you the formula, but then I think you know how to use it. Hope so. <laughs> Equation of a tangent plane. Just make sure you know how to build it. Equation of the tangent plane. It's a new formula, so it's going to be on a test. When we introduce a new formula, and especially the important one like this, yeah, it's going to be on a test. The equation of a tangent plane was derivative with respect to x at the point. So that's a slope, right? x0, y0, z0. <laughs> Shift x minus x0. Plus, guess what? Derivative with respect to y at the point. That's a slope times y minus y0. Shift. Guess what? Very unpredictable. Fz at x0, y0, z0 times the shift. So you just find all of this. We give you the point. So we give you x0, y0, z0. It is given. y0, z0 is given. It's basically... Mm. mx plus b, mx plus b, y equals mx plus b, m is a slope. So slope with respect to x, slope with respect to y, slope with respect to z, and shift each every time. So practice that. I have nice videos on that, so you don't have to, I don't have to spend time on this. There's nice, uh, there are nice problems about the maximum rate of change of a temperature, that kind of stuff. Again, direction of the maximum rate of change, that is gradient, but then the size of it, what is the maximum rate of change? That's going to be magnitude. Directional derivative, directional ma maximum rate of change is directional derivative, so it's gradient times u. Let me show you what I mean. Write down and just work on it by yourself. Number five from the review. This formula number five, this equation number five, the temperature of the gas, blah, blah, blah. See, this is how you should know. So it was a good question about the terminology. Direction of maximum rate of change. So is it directional derivative or is it direction of gradient? If I give you the direction V in the direction of V, then it's a directional derivative. That's how I would say. So A was directional derivative. B, just gradient, because there was no direction given. You see, just point. Well, at first it was rate of change. What is a direction? And the third one is, what is the maximum rate of change? That's a magnitude. So at the last step, I find the magnitude. I feel the terminology confuses people. So I'll try to write down exam as clear as possible. Because uh, the... From English point of view, it's confusing. I feel that's just not fair. Okay, two more things to review. Maximum, minimum, settle point, that kind of stuff. That will take forever, so we're for sure not going to be doing lots of stuff here. But I will show you that what you should review. Well, for sure, you just should review those topics from the exam review. But we had max, mean, global, and local. Local, we had three. Local mean, local max, and a saddle point. That is a good problem. It can be very good both as a multiple choice and free response. Because in the free multiple choice, I can just ask you, if I give you given derivatives, do you know what's going on here? And you need to know how to work on those. If I just give you a function, this is what you do. You find partial derivatives. You find critical points by solving the system. You create a determinant. And that's going to be D. And then you judge based on that. If determinant, do you remember plus plus? If determinant is positive, yeah, let me write down. D is XX x y y x y y 
And we have three cases. If D is <coughs> D is positive, then what? Oh, negative. Let's do negative first. Settle point. Oh, now you know, right? Because that's the one. That's the one you want to have. Because it's less work. If it's negative, then it's a saddle point. Saddle point. Saddle point, it's when it's min and max at the same time from one direction. It's minimum. From another direction, it's maximum. I just realized on Tuesday that our nose has a saddle point. If you look at, well, at least if it's curved, right? If you look at from this point of view, then there is a minimum here. But if you look at from this point of view, then there is a maximum here. I just realized that's randomly. I don't know why. Very random thought. Now, if it is positive, then we don't know. We have two ideas. We need to check f, x, x. f, x, x. So, negative, negative. Saddle point. But if it's positive and positive, it's a smiley face. That is minimum. Minimum. If it's if it's, uh, yeah, it's not negative, yeah, just basically, we don't even go to the second step, I guess. So it's a pirate then. Yeah, there's no next. Oh, I'll put a cross. That's a pirate. If it's positive and then negative, then it is, go away, nose. So it is maximum, exactly. Like so. So you have to do that. Free responsive, that's a free response. It's a lot of steps, so it's kind of nice to figure out. I don't want to put all those rectangular boxes and optimization problems. Oh, yeah, did you see how much time it took? That was crazy. So I don't plan to do any optimization problems. Uh, reading the problem in 50 minutes, that's going to be so much time. The dimension of rectangular box, this and that. And optimize the window, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, good luck with that in 50 minutes. So I feel it's not fair. But what if I give you partial derivatives? Then can you figure out the answer? Like this. So first of all, know how to do all of this. And don't forget, before you, before you go to D, you need to find uh, critical points. Critical points. That's something you have to review. We had it on quiz six, remember? Critical points, everything. That's kind of challenging because you need to solve derivative. So step one, find critical points. Step two, plug the point you need. Step two, plug and create the determinant, plug the point, check the sign. Step three, conclude. Example, you tell me right now the answer. I saw the question, just a second. Let me uh, finish that. X, X at one, one is seven. X, Y at 1, 1 is 8. Y, Y at 1, 1 is 10. What is happening with F? Then F at 1, 1 has what? Local mean, local max, saddle point, nothing. Well, we kind of already know that uh, 1, 1 is a critical point. That's given. Can you figure out? Wow, you're fast. Let's see. Solution. So what did you do first? Yeah, exactly. 7, 8, 8, 10. I'm just carefully putting it in the determinant, which is 7 times 10 minus 8 times 8 which is six. Six is positive, so it's not a settle point anymore. We already have first plus. Then you check this point, seven. Seven, seven is also positive. It's a smiley face. Local mean. Can you do that? That's a very easy with a cheat sheet. But that's the problem. We don't give you cheat sheets. Uh, that's the unfortunate part. I'm really advocating for cheat sheets, and we are not allowing this at ASU and math department. High standards, that's what they say. Okay. Where well, was the question? I forgot who asked the question. So make sure you can do that. Sometimes we just ask you to find the saddle points. 
Look at this. This one has so many saddle points. You see, every time you see a sign, you know it's going to be waves. And it's multiplied by something. So it's waves. And it's like a curtain that is waving. Pretty cool. Or in the wind. Curtain with the wind. So make sure you know how to do that. Absolute max mean too time consuming. No freaking way. Remember you were struggling with this? And I barely could help you because I was having fever at home. So I was like, yeah, I don't <laughs> I cannot help you right now. But I think people were amazing in the forum, so they were helping a lot. Good job, people in the forum. So yeah, that's too time consuming. I will not give you that. Question? <laughs> the last problem, are we gonna always have the continuous function? So yeah, yeah. We're gonna give you something nice, there uh, amazing. Another, there was another formula like you can run not Yeah, no, I'm gonna, not gonna give you that. Yeah, for sure, continuous, everything is nice. So I have lots of nice problems. I spend lots of time creating that. Double integrals, and we can do a quiz, maybe like five minutes maximum. Yeah. Today is a quiz, but it's only two problems. So actually, I will explain you right now what you need for the quiz. So that's perfect. This problem looks like from the quiz, to be honest. That would be awkward if that's the case. <laughs> ah, whatever. Let me just show you. So that's something I missed. Uh, people told me that they missed me, which is nice to know. Double chocolate. Double, double integral. Double integrals require double chocolate. So the whole idea is, but you know, when I skip my classes, I'm very happy that I have everything recorded. So even if you did not like the substitution, you should always just, you can always just watch my videos. Example, double integral x sine x plus y dA over r. New notation, everything is confusing. Oh my goodness, what is happening? It's fine. You have r. I will not give you this notation, actually. Students get confused with this notation of the boxes. <clears throat> I was considering, and I realized too complicated. 0 pi over 6. So this is too confusing for people, I noticed. How do you know which one is x? How do you know which one is y? But basically, they mean width height of the rectangle. That's what they mean here. So width times height. It's like uh, the box is 5 by 6 feet. And this one have two coordinates. So graph first. Graph is the most important. You want to sketch what you see. And what you see is x is from 0 to pi over 6. Y is from 0 to pi over 2. And you have a box. This box called R. So whatever is below, that is what is the domain. That's called a domain. It's a shadow of the two-dimensional object in the air. Mm, restricted shadow. So we have, check it out. This function inside does not do anything for now. This function is floating in the air like a curtain, or maybe it's a sphere floating by, a bird. And we want to know what is happening with this bird only above this R. So we're kind of restricting the domain of three-dimensional object. That is the idea. It's like we have a whole building, but I only know what how much shade it gives on the east side of the building. That's a restricted domain, R. And then you create the integral. Integral, integral from... 0 to, so let's write down x sine x plus y dx dy. You follow the order. The inside integral is in terms of x, then put x there. 0 pi over 6. The outside integral is with respect to y, so 0 pi over 2. If you have only numbers, if you have only numbers of the integrate integrals, you can actually multiply just two integrals with respect to x and with respect to y. But I don't like doing that. I like just seeing it this way. This inside integral will be diff integrated with respect to x. So we are doing partial derivatives. We are doing partial differentiation. So I'm keeping the outside integral. It will wait. 
And in the red color, I'm integrating x, sine x plus y, with respect to x, which is like, whoa, what's going on here? I don't know. That's integration by parts, exactly. I, B, P. And that's what I wanted to ask. Easy and then mix means it's not easy and we should switch and integrate with respect to Y first. You can only do it when everything is in terms of numbers or if you're careful with the graph, that's called reversing the integration. Sometimes it's impossible to start integral unless you switch the order. So instead of doing integration by parts, we don't like that. We're going to reverse reverse the order. In this case, you can just reverse without thinking because uh, all are numbers. Pi over 6 and pi over 2. x sine x plus y dy dx. Oh, yes, I know how to integrate this function with respect to y. Now, inside integral is with respect to y. So it will be from 0 to pi over 6. This is 6. Bless you. x sine x plus y. So what do you think is going to happen with that function? Integral of sine is negative cosine. Negative cosine of x plus y. And then you divide by the leading coefficient in front of y only over 1 dx. And then you have a new function, a new integral from 0 to pi over 6 minus x cosine x plus y dx. Oh, we forgot to plug the numbers. I forgot to plug the numbers. Bar from 0 to pi over 2. And that's why it becomes easier now because now we're completely getting rid of y. Plug the numbers. Let me just cross it. Don't forget to plug the numbers. Top minus the bottom. And you continue integrating something we learned from calculus 1. Pi over 6. It's going to be minus x cosine x plus pi over 2. Minus minus plus x cosine x dx, and then you integrate that, which also requires integration by parts and so on. That's too complicated example, so I don't really expect you to do that one. But you need to review integration by parts and use substitution. Finally, let me explain you the triangle thing, which is not that straightforward. When the limits are not numbers, that is more important. So that is going to be on a test. More likely to be on the test. Zero, one. Yes, this is good. This one. Double integrals over anything. If it's not a square or rectangle, then it's going to be any function. That's 12.2. 12.2. Integral from 0, 1. Integral 4y. 4 e to the x squared dx dy. We actually have this function in calculus 2 class. You don't remember that, but it was there. And you cannot integrate e to the x squared with respect to x. It's not, it's example of not integrable function. To integrate that, you have to switch to order. That's an example when you have to switch to order. To do that, you need to Imagine the situation. Completely ditch whatever is inside. That is not important. Very interesting that that's important only when you integrate stuff. So ditch that. You need to re visualize what is happening here. So picture is extremely important. Can you write, please? Okay, thank you. Picture is for... So I first look at the outside variable. Outside variable is y. Y is from 0 to 1. So this is a three-dimensional problem, but I'm going into 2D right now. For y, I see we are from 0 to 1. 0 to 1. But then for x, for x, I'm trying to change the color. 
Wow, that was like very rude. Yeah, it's slowing down. Too much talking. For x, we have x equals 4 and x equals 4y. Here they are. So we are going from top to bottom. From line x equals 4. So that means not from top to bottom. That's from right. From line x equals 4 to line x equals 4y, which is something like that. <coughs> That is a triangle from 0 to 1, from x equals 4 to x equals 4y. Do you know how to draw x equals 4y? It's y equals x over 4, right? y equals x over 4, so something like that. So from here, you can change integration. Look how I'm reading this. This is the most important, but I do have good YouTube videos on this, so you don't have to actually just rely on this information as crucial so much. Y is changing from 0 to 1. This is the biggest change, and it can be 0 0.5 and everything in between. So from 0 to 1, while X is changing from lower to bigger, from 4Y to 4, like this. So to reverse the integration, we need to go the other way around. Let's x be numbers. dx goes outside first. If x are numbers, it's going to be from 0 to what? 4. Outside are numbers. So from 0 to 4. Copy the function inside. We don't care about that because it's going to be only when you integrate. Not, not important for now. And now dy will be functions and you do top minus the bottom well which function is on the top uh, oh come on just like betraying me uh it will be x equals 4y but i need to figure out how careful to write it down since it's in terms of y it should be y equals y equals make sense or else doesn't make sense how you're going to plug it. So it's going to be y equals x over 4 from top to bottom. It's like from 0 to 1, but that's in terms of num uh, functions. And how to call this line over here? y equals 0. And this is how you reverse it. And now you can actually integrate that. So when you have a picture, it's getting better. It's, you, it's required. Numbers functions and then you change the order functions numbers yes why would you just not do um, right to left like good question you always do y is going up and down okay let me i think uh, i know how to explain it better x is from zero to four agree that's not vectors just like you know i'm just like trying to explain so x is from zero, small number, to big number. It's always on the increase. But y is height, right? So y is height, how tall my building is. And I cannot say my building is from zero to 16 feet. I want to indicate the function. So the function will be from smaller y equals zero to the bigger, but bigger is a function and it's, and it's a line, it's tilted y equals x over 4. So that's why 0 goes down, x over 4 goes up. <coughs> Roof. Oh, that's maybe this is how. And floor. Oh, that maybe makes sense. Yeah. Yes? Well, the one that you had above, like the original uh, one before you like, reverse the order, could you draw it again? Like, yeah, yeah. How come? Oh, oh. Yeah, that one. How come? I guess I'm confused about like, why the 4 y Because if it's top, Oh, yeah, I know your question. Why is it on the top? Why? So this is how you write it down. If it is in terms of x, it's x equals x equals, right? And then order doesn't matter here. You just write down x equals 4, x equals 4, y. Here it is. Picture is ready. You created a triangle. This is a triangle. And now you work with it to reverse the order. But uh, what you're saying is, y was from 0 to 1, x was from 4y, so it was like this, 2x, uh, 2, 4, right? From the line for y to x equals 4. 
Is this what you're asking about? Yes, and then I guess that makes sense because it's right minus five and four. Exactly. It's always bigger minus smaller, but in the integral notation, it's from to. So from small to big, from floor to roof, or from left to right. Yeah. Yes? How do you know x goes from 0 to 4? Oh, it's so here. See? From 0, and then this line was x equals 4. So it's stuck at 4. Yeah, we want to have numbers this time. Outside integral gives you numbers. Yes. For the internal notation, smaller, bigger. Left to right or bottom top. So let me see. Left, right. Yeah. In type 2 is the different one. Yes. So left to right and then floor to roof. I think I like this explanation. Good job, people. 12 points. Three also goes to the test, don't forget. Let me pause.